Well, last night, as we were praying with Eric and Suzanne, I can tell you, folks, that Eric's the real deal. Eric has an anointing on his life, a calling on his life. He has the bite of Almighty God so deep in his soul. And his one purpose in life is to leave here today exalting the name of Jesus Christ. His one purpose here today is to bring you closer to the cross of Jesus Christ. So without any further ado, let me ask Eric to come up, please. Eric Metaxas, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Wow. Holy cow. How did you guys sneak in here? I'm not prepared for this. I just want to, want to get the negative stuff out of the way. I'm not a morning person. Uh, I resent the invitation. Uh, I figured I'll probably show up, but I'm not going to like it. But uh, there's more negative stuff. Wait, I'm not done. Um, I uh, really, I, I'm so honored by this invitation uh, and the idea that you were supposed to hear from Herb Lusk and you have to hear from me. Let me begin by saying, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, here's a funny thing. I know some of you in this room say, I'm, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, whatever. If you do, I wrote a book called Letter to the American Church. That's specifically for Christians. And in that book, part of what I say is most of us who say we're Christians are actually, what's a nice word, full of baloney? Can I say baloney in a group like this? I could say other things. Because when you say you believe something, the fact of the matter is, do you? Do you actually believe it? The Bible says Jesus defeated death on the cross. If you believe that, if you claim to be a Christian, you say, well, boy, I believe it, I believe it. Well, it's not a metaphor, it's true. And if he defeated death on the cross, you should look forward with joy to the day you leave this world and see him face to face. Now, most of us don't. Most of us are kind of living in this limbo land of, I, I hope it's true. Well, it's pathetic if you hope it's true. You need to know it's true. It's God's will that you know it's true. If you don't know that it's true, you don't believe it. And I'm here, here's good news for you. God wants you to believe it, and he wants to make a way for you to believe it because he loves you. Because he doesn't want you to live in the shadow lands of like, oh, I hope it's true. I don't know. Because a lot of us live in that world. We think death is so sad. It's so sad that Herb died. No, not for Herb. If you understand what the Bible says, there's nothing conceivably more wonderful than leaving this place and going to be in the presence of the God who invented the universe and every good thing that you've ever seen is just a hint of the goodness of God. Now, I'm just here to tell you, we've got it so good in America, or we had it so good until recently, we had it so good <laughs> that we don't think about the next life. But if you're suffering, if you're suffering in any way, you're wise to look forward to the day that you're released from this suffering. You're going to be in the presence of God. It's going to be more real than this. It's not going to be boring, floating around on clouds. It's something so unimaginably heavenly, glorious, beautiful. I promise you when I tell you, you can't imagine it. But by faith, you have to understand the God who created that world, he is so loving and so full of goodness that we are fools not to look forward to being where Herb is right now. But most of us are fools. I get that. We live in half measures. And I'm just here to tell you it's God's will that you live in real faith knowing the truth that he is real, that he loves you, he has a plan for your life, all of that stuff. So if you claim to be a Christian, I'm just here to tell you God wants you to live in total joy and expectation of that reality. Not to be like, well, I'm doing the best I can. The Lord, the Lord loves you and died for you. He doesn't want you to do the best you can. He wants you to release yourself into the best that he can do, which is everything necessary. So I just wanted to start 
with that. Uh, the book is Letter to the American Church, and I wrote that specific, I've never written a book in my life for Christians until this book, but I think we need an encouraging message. Most of the books that I write, I've written 14, this is my 14th book. I don't think the children's books count, they're kind of short. I've written 14 books for the rest of us, and um, the, uh, the one that I wrote before Letter to the American Church is called Is Atheism Dead? And I want to talk about that a little bit today, because I think Christians and non-Christians alike, a lot of us really wonder, we're afraid to ask the questions like, I don't know, what can I know? Is science consonant with faith? Are they separate or, or whatever? And I think that a lot of us, you know, particularly in our generation, we've kind of bought into this lie that there is some kind of daylight between rationality and faith or between science and faith. That is not only not true, it's unbelievably stupid and wrong on, er on a level that you can't even comprehend. And, and, and once I began to see that, I thought, I gotta write a book about this, because most people, including Christians, don't have any clue of the level of evidence for God. It's kind of like talking about the evidence. Do you have evidence that the Earth is a sphere uh, and not flat? Like, how, where are we on that? Any flat earthers in the group? There may be, and to those people I say, please get out now, please, because I don't want to talk to you. But the fact of the matter is there's certain things that you talk about, and if somebody says to you, well, you know, I'm open to the idea that the earth is flat, you know, I would walk away from that guy. Like, because there's certain things, that, excuse me, that, like the ancient, it wasn't Columbus, the ancient Greeks knew that the earth was a sphere and not flat. So like we kind of covered that like 25 centuries ago, that's done. So we don't go like, well, who's to say? We're looking into it. <laughs> if somebody's looking into it, you say, well, you need to, you really need to understand that that's, we're not looking into that anymore. We moved on, we figured it out. But I'm here to tell you that the evidence for God is at least equal to that, but most of us don't know it. And we need to know it, because as times get tough, we need to know that what the Bible says and what we say we believe if we're Christians, it's not just, hey, it works for me, it made me a better husband, it made me a better businessman, it gives me peace. Those are all nice, but it's also true, you know? It's like saying, do you believe in math? Yeah, I believe in math. It's like, because it's true, you don't need to like it. It's good if you're building bridges, you know, you're going to need math, but it's just true, right? And I think that we need to understand that the truth of God, it's, tr it's true. And I think, think sometimes we need to understand that God in these last days, and when I say these last days, I'm not talking about the prophetic clock, uh, I mean, maybe I am, but I'm also talking about that in our lifetimes, the evidence from science for God has just gone through the roof, you can't even imagine. When I really began understanding some of this stuff, I thought, I've gotta write about this, because almost no one knows this. We've all bought into this narrative, secular narrative, that, yeah, the really smart people are pretty sure God doesn't exist, right? And how many people know that you can be unbelievably smart and really stupid also? <laughs> okay, I, I'm, here, I'm just here to tell you, like intelligence and wisdom by the way, if your phone rings, it could be my wife. I don't want her to know I'm here, so just tell her I'm at the bar. She doesn't know I do this kind of stuff. Um, that's not true. She's right here, my lovely wife of 26 years, and I'm really glad that, she, uh, that she's, she's with me. I'm sure if she weren't with me on this trip, I'd still be sleeping upstairs. And uh, I, uh, but I, I really, you know, when I talk about science, I'm, I mean, I should tell you just a, briefly, my story, how I got to be where I am, and, and my, my own journey. My journey is this. My mother and father, who by the grace of God are still living uh, in Connecticut, we're gonna drive all the way up there after this today. We live in New York City. But um, they met in an English class in New York City. My father came from Greece, my mother came from Germany, and they met in an English class. This is not like a chess class on Milton and Chaucer. You understand this? This is how to speak English, okay? They met in an English class, and when a Greek and a German get married, and they have kids, those kids will be raised Greek. 
That's, I don't know why, that's just a law. It's just a law, it's like a mathematical law. And so I was raised in the Greek Orthodox Church, which is a wonderful community. If you've ever uh, hung around Greeks, you know that they know that they're the best ethnicity in the world. And they look down on you a little bit, but not that much, because they would say, well, you can be Greek too if you hang out with me, and, and uh, we're not gonna talk about whatever it is that you are, we're not gonna talk about that, because Greeks are the best. So I was raised in the Greek community, and it's a really warm, wonderful community. But as you know, with a lot of ethnic Christianity, some of you were raised in churches where you realize it's a cultural thing more than a theological thing or whatever. And so you kind of, you never get, you know, what, what we Christians call the good news of Jesus Christ, that we need to have a personal relationship. But you never really get that. It's just like, be a good boy, study hard, don't get in trouble, you know. And so by the time I graduated high school, I went, I had the, you know, the American dream. I went to Yale University, right? And I thought, wow, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, the working class European immigrant son going to an Ivy League school. What I didn't know, of course, is that, you know, most of higher education, especially places like Yale, which they're the worst, they are as secular and hostile to the Bible and to Christian thinking, to biblical thinking, to any kind of conservatism, traditionalism, loving American, you know, like that, it, that's all, they moved on from that, like in like 1968. And so I kind of walk into the situation and I thought, okay, well, I don't know anything. I just came from a working class home. We didn't get to go to college and stuff. So this is, tell me, you know, what. And so by the time I graduated, you can imagine I was totally confused. I thought, well, you know, all the smart people don't really believe in God. They think America's a big problem, and uh, I, you know, I guess uh, they must be right because they, they got here first, and you know, and so at places like Yale, um, their attitude toward the big questions of life, like does life have meaning? Is there a reason you're here? They secretly know the answer is no. There's no God. Your life is meaningless, but that's so depressing, we just won't talk about it. So just get a really good job and focus on that. On the weekends, there's like alcohol and sports to distract you. But don't think about the meaning of life because we've kind of figured out life has no meaning. We evolved out of the primordial soup by accident and we're, you know, we come from nowhere, we're going nowhere. It's really bleak, let's not talk about it. So in a weird way, the whole culture, but especially these intellectual uh, institutions in the academy, they don't go there. You know, 200 years ago, they would go there and they would say, we're created by God, he has a purpose for our life, he has a meaning, whatever. But in the last decades, that's not the case. So when I graduated Yale, you can imagine, I was totally confused, you know? Because their attitude is like, don't think about those depressing questions, just get a good job and don't think about it. And uh, you know, I was an English major, I wanted to be a writer, so you can guess I did not get a good job. And if you graduate from college and you don't get a good job, you flounder and you fl I want to be a writer. So you flounder and you float and you drift. And you, we know what happens if you do that out of college. What happens is you end up moving back in with your parents. Now, if your parents are working class European immigrants, you really don't want to end up moving back there because they're looking at you like, why are you here? You know, my, my friend's parents would be like, oh, it's wonderful, Eric. He wants to be a poet or a writer and he's finding himself. And my parents would be like, yeah, he needs to find himself a job <laughs> and get out. And so it was really a hard time for me. I can laugh now, ha <laughs> ha. But it was at the time unbelievably uh, painful. You haven't met my parents, I'm telling you. It was not fun. So um, I, I went through a really hard time because I was really wrestling with these issues because I had been basically taught you can't, there is no God. If there is a God, you definitely can't know him. And those loony Christians who claim to know him, or they're obviously nuts, and so, you know, they're, they're violent insurrectionists or something. You just want to avoid those loony people. You know, all the elites know that there's, there's nothing. And um, so I, I went through a hard time. But the good news, by living with my parents, I was away from my friends and I could think a little bit, whatever, I ended up getting a really horrible job as a proofreader at Union Carbide in Danbury, Connecticut. It's a miracle that I didn't kill myself. 
Like, that's funny and sad at the same time. It's like it was so bleak, you know. I was like a humor writer, I'm writing short stories, but now I'm working in an incorporate chemical environment. Kill me now. But in the middle of that mess, God sent someone to share Jesus with me. And of course, I know, you know, as he's approaching me and talking to me about this stuff, these people are crazy, so just keep your distance. But I was in enough pain to listen a little bit over the course of months. And over the course of like literally 10, 11 months of twisting in the wind, living with my parents, did I mention that was unpleasant? <laughs> I was, I opened like the tiniest crack, and I'm not joking, just maybe, probably not. But then one night, God miraculously spoke to me in a dream. I'm not gonna tell you that story, but it was totally mind-blowing, miraculous Jesus dream, the kind you read about in a book. In fact, I put it in two of my books. I don't think they're here today, but I have written about it. And I, if you go on the internet, you go to my website, ericpataxis.com, there's a video, I tell the story. But it was, I needed a miracle of that nature because I was so gummed up with intellectual foolishness, really. And it changed everything. It gave me hope, uh, it gave me joy. Um, all those cliches are true. So it changed my life. Um, but as a Christian, I began to read. I thought, how is it that I've grown up in a world that has decided there is no God or the people who take that seriously are nuts? Like, what? I need to start reading some books. So I started reading some books. And over the course of decades, I've read all these books. And it's amazing to me that we live in a world that pretends that there's evidence against God, that there's no evidence for God, whatever, because I'm just here to tell you that is flat out wrong. But we live in a time now where maybe we're familiar with the concept that elites put out information that might not be 100%. <laughs> it's kind of sickening if you think about it. It is sickening, right? Because you trust people and you find out, oh, that's not true. Or, oh, I thought they had my best interests, whatever, but they didn't. It's, there, there's something it's not pleasant to figure that out, but I feel like I've been figuring this out since the day I met Jesus, that the whole world pretends like this is nonsense, and I know it's not nonsense, and I'm reading books and reading books and encountering writers and thinkers and people, and you know, every now and again you'll bump into somebody like Herb Lusk or whatever, and you just go like, I don't know, this seems real. But the whole world says it's nonsense. Now you know in 1966 Time Magazine put on its cover, Is God Dead? Right? It's like the elites decided, let's take this unbelievable bummer of an idea and bring it into America's living rooms. Because, you know, the elites had already established this, you know, with Darwin and Freud, and so they already established that, you know, life is bleak and not worth living, there's no meaning. But they thought, now it's time to introduce it to middle America. And so we've all been living kind of in the penumbra, to use a goofball word, of that, you know, for the last 50 or so years. And as I did my research and reading, I thought, this is crazy. The evidence for God is not just good. It's like the flat earth stuff. It's like it's open and shut. And I thought, I need to put it in a book. And, and once you realize the level of evidence for God, it's so astonishing. The only question you're going to ask is, is atheism dead? And I'm here to tell you 1,000%, yes, it is. And people say, well, but I'm an atheist. Well, they're also flat earthers. That's your issue. Like, I, I'm not going to tell you, you can't be a fool because it's a free country. But I'm here to tell you, if you care to look into the evidence, you will be very embarrassed. Or you will pretend to have an argument around it, but you, there are no arguments around it. What really precipitated my writing the book, Is Atheism Dead?, when it really kind of hit me, amazed me, was I met a man in Houston named James Tour. He's a probably not probably, certainly one of the top scientists in the world today. He's a nanoscientist at Rice University. And I met him in Houston about four or five years ago, and he said, he starts talking to me about something I'd never thought about, right? Because if you're in the Christian world, a lot of times Christians will argue about evolution and, well, you know, all that stuff. You're arguing about how, okay, we got life. How did life become like us? That's a conversation you could have, you know. But he said, forget that, forget that. If you ask a scientist, any scientist, when did life first emerge? They say, oh, it's very simple. We know that science first emerged 
four billion years ago, single-celled life, the simplest celled life imaginable, emerged on planet Earth four billion years ago. And then you say, oh, that, that's nice. H how did that happen? And they will give you some answer. This was probably on your test in high school, okay? Uh, un unless you're, you know, in your 80s, this was on the test in high school. And there was a an experiment in the University of Chicago in 1952. It was on the test, Miller-Urey experiment, where they ran some electricity through some non-living solution, which they said this was probably what was on the surface of the Earth about four billion years ago. And if lightning strikes it, we're going to put some electricity through here. We think that catalyzed, you know, terms like catalyzed sound fancy, right? Like catalyzed something, and we got some amino acids, right? Now, I'm not a chemist, most of you are not chemists, but the point is that they said, amino acids, those are the building blocks of protein, we are on our way to the first cells, right? So James Tour, when I met him four or five years ago, he says, Eric, I'm a nanoscientist. What he didn't say to me is like, I know more about this than anyone on the planet, and I'm here to tell you, those dudes have been blowing smoke for 70 years. They have not moved the ball forward, this like happy moment in 1952, woo, we got amino acids. He says, do, do you have any idea how far amino acids are from single-celled life, from the simplest life imaginable? Do you have any idea of the infinite distance? And they acted like, well, we'll get there. He's like, well, here's the issue. It's been seven decades. They have not moved that ball forward one millimeter. They have spent so much time working on this that if they're honest, they now, what they didn't know in 1952, they know today. And what is that? They know that there's not the ghost of a ghost of a ghost of a ghost of a chance that you can go from amino acids to life in any way that's like random stuff. Because understand, we're not talking about evolution. You can't have evolution before you have life, right? But we've all kind of bought into this idea that, no, it just happened, and, oh, we discovered water on a planet, you know, there's going to be fish jumping out of puddles up there any second, you know. <laughs> and he's here to say, no, I happen to know how complex it is to create a molecule and how complex, guys, this is what he does in the lab, and he's saying, like, the, what we've learned in the last 70 years is, like, this is as far from reality, this is infinitely farther from reality than we thought in 1952 when everybody's like clicking their heels, hey, we've got the first step. He says that the complexity of a single cell, the simplest form of life, again, it doesn't get simpler than a single cell. He says, we now know that a single cell is so complex, like you would die contemplating the complexity of a single cell. So the idea that this just kind of emerged like a jelly donut, like, hey, we got a membrane, we got a nucleus, like, you, you understand what you're talking about? And that's like, then they discovered DNA, which is like an infinitely complex computer code that just happens to be in all of life. So the point is, if you've bought into this narrative that there's no God, and uh, you're, kind of, you're kind of clinging to this narrative, and he's saying, sorry, but you know, you may not like the idea that there's a God who created the universe, but that the evidence for it is just like beyond belief. But what's really beyond belief is that nobody's talking about it. We're still being gaslit into thinking like, well, all the logical smart people think there's no life, and it's like, no, that you're, they're, they're blowing smoke, they're playing games, right? You know, if you want to sleep with your grad student, the whole idea of God is really depressing. I mean, let's be honest. We're talking about human beings. They don't like that idea. Or maybe it's just that if they say that there's a God, it'll embarrass them with their colleagues. That's, this is how most people make decisions, right? We're not really logical beings. We make decisions based on, I don't know, that could hurt my prospects for this or for that. So when I met James Tour and he kind of lays this out for me, I thought, Nobody's ever talking about that. How do you get life from non-life? It's almost funny. It's like if you found like a laptop, you know, in the sand at the beach and you say, this is fascinating. Look what the wind and the waves have created. <laughs> like everybody knows like, no, I don't think so. Have you looked under the keyboard? I don't think this happened, you know, through the wind and the waves. But if this is, we're talking about something even more complex than that. So that's what kind of made me think like, 
Nobody's talking about this. That's the ultimate question. You say to a scientist, life, how did that happen? And you will hear crickets because, I mean, some of them will, will pretend like, well, it's like, you know, they'll start talking in ways that you're immediately confused because they can do that, right? But that's just one thing. Um, the other evidence for God in the last, let's say, 40, 50 years since this Time Magazine article has to do with what's called a fine-tuned universe. Now, some, anybody here familiar with that term, the fine-tuned universe? A few of you. You can go out and take, take a cigarette break. Um, <laughs> but let me just say that the evidence for the fine-tuned universe has been piling up and up and up and up to the point where now it is, again, open and shut insane. It's insane. Fine-tuned universe simply means that scientists would n begin notice things, noticing things. Like they notice that, son of a gun, the, the size of the Earth, you know, if you watch Star Trek, it's like there could be life on any kind of planet and there's all this different kinds of, and they're like, no. No, we've, we've discovered that the size of this Earth, if it was a couple of percentage smaller, there could be no atmosphere, no life. Like, we now know that. But really creepy, if it were a tiny bit bigger, same thing. It looks to be exactly the right size for life. Aren't we lucky? <laughs> now, that's one of the simplest metrics imaginable. But are you hearing that in school? Are we teaching that in school? This is what science says. This is not what Christians say. This is what science says that we've now discovered that the planet size is, is not just optimal for life, but that if it were a little bigger or a little smaller, I mean a little bit, not 20%, like a tiny bit bigger, a tiny bit smaller, no life. And you think, well, that's interesting. But what's weird is every single place you look, from the laws of physics to the way chemicals are constructed, to the universe, to where our moon is, to the size of our moon, everything looks perfectly designed. Now, you could take my word for it. You could read my book, Is Atheism Dead? You could read other books on the subject. But the point is, these are scientific facts that we now know. And these facts are making naturalistic, atheistic scientists deeply uncomfortable. Because the science, exactly the opposite of what we've been hearing, the more we learn from science, the more we're going to know we don't need God, exactly the opposite has been happening extremely dramatically to the point where there's nothing you can look at in science and not see an insane level of design. And again, I am not even, I, I'm barely, barely, barely scratching the surface. It becomes so preposterous that it stops your heart, that, that we're living in a time where everywhere we look in science, we see evidence of fine-tuning that you just say, there's no way this could have just happened. There's no way anything could account for this except some infinite intelligence that did this. I mean, one of my favorite examples is the planet Jupiter, right? Some of, anybody here ever see Jupiter in the night sky? I'm just curious. Any, anybody? Some of you have. You can take your cigarette break. Go ahead. <laughs> Jupiter is 400 million miles away. I think I saw it for the first time in my life like two weeks ago. I'm not kidding. And I, and I realized, okay, I think that's Jupiter. It's just a pinprick if you know where to look. And, and uh, you know, and it's the right place, whatever, but it's 400 million miles away. Science now knows that if Jupiter weren't there, we could not be here. And you think, well, that sounds crazy. What could that pinprick of light 400 million miles away have to do with whether we're existing here? Well, science says that the level of asteroids and meteors that would be striking Earth would, would have made it impossible for life ever to emerge. It would be like a thousand times as many striking the Earth. But because Jupiter, which is so in incredibly massive, it has unbelievable gravity, it draws away most of the meteors and asteroids or whatever that would otherwise be hitting us. And again, you go like, hey, that's, what a great break for us. <laughs> but those are two tiny things. And I'm telling you, there are hundreds of these things that we've discovered in recent decades. As this idea that there's no God has kind of congealed into the worldview, 
It's like the evidence has piled up and up and up and up. And it goes on and on and on. I have a chapter in Is Atheism Dead on water? Like, trust me when I tell you, I never thought I'd write a chapter on water. What water is, is like the most insane confection. You just can't, because we take it, what could you take for granted more than water? But when you start realizing what it is and what it does and how it makes everything possible, it's like, it, it begins to get freaky. God, I think, when you really study some of this stuff, it becomes frightening. You say, who is this God that, that he's able to do, that he did this? And I, I'm not kidding when I say that as, as somebody who didn't used to believe in God, I can totally understand how somebody just wants to blow off the whole idea because part of it is uncomfortable. You think, if, if God is able to create everything and to create us and to create flowers and every beautiful thing and it, it becomes overwhelming it's too much to bear in a way and it's just easier to go like no I don't think so but the evidence is as I say at this point utterly overwhelming if you're honest if you're honest if you want to just like look away you can just look away but the evidence is unbelievably overwhelming and there's another part of the book, the reason I wrote the book, I'll just say this briefly, but I also, uh, around the time that I met this man in Houston, I met another man in Albuquerque. It sounds like a Johnny Cash song, right? <laughs> I met a man in Albuquerque just to watch him die. Um, who did I meet in Albuquerque? I was speaking at a church in Albuquerque, and the pastor says, oh, you got to meet Dr. Stephen Collins. He's this amazing uh, archaeologist, and he discovered biblical Sodom. I said, what? he said, what? Like, you know, I read on this stuff. I think I would have heard about that one. Really? Well, I looked into it, and like all this other stuff, I, I couldn't believe that I'd never heard of this before, but this is a man. Now, remember, Sodom and Gomorrah, we're talking, this is the cu first couple of pages of the Bible. If there's anything that you want to dismiss as mythical, it's the first couple of pages of the Bible that, you know, from, you know, meteors or something from out of space destroy, obliterate, Sodom and Gomorrah, you, you just think like, well, I don't, you know, if that happened, it happened in mythical times, well, archaeology certainly isn't going to be able to tell me one way or the other. Well, without going into the story, because we don't have the time, but I will just tell you, there, this is, it becomes, again, open and shut. Like the details, in, in, in the book, uh, I devote a whole chapter to it to give you the details, because the details are what will blow your mind. You're like, there's no doubt, there's no doubt that he discovered biblical Sodom and the details of how it was destroyed, whatever. There was an article in Nature Magazine. Nature Magazine is like one of the premier uh, scientific peer-reviewed journals in the world. They devoted a very, very long article, 20 scientists, most of whom, all of whom probably are not Christians, wrote about the details of what they discovered at this site. And in this peer-reviewed article, they reference the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah just to say, like, this sounds so much like that, we kind of have to mention it. And, you know, their attitude is that's probably where that crazy idea came from because, yeah, it happened. Well, the fact of the matter is that in the world of archaeology, I talked about the world of science. The world of science every single day is underscoring the evidence for God in ways that will stop your heart if you dare to look. The evidence from archaeology over the decades is the same thing. More and more and more it corroborates the Bible as history on levels that, if you care to look into it, it will freak you out. That this ancient document is history. That names are being discovered. The things, that it, it just, it's just unbelievable. And so I just said, I've got to write a book with the title, Is Atheism Dead? Because most people, Christians and non-Christians, we, we, we're unaware of this evidence. Maybe it exists in some books that we haven't heard of or that, you know, we don't have the patience to read. But we need to know that in these crazy times, God has made evidence of himself available to us on a level that was undreamt of a few decades ago. And I think it's because maybe we need that right now. Maybe we need to know... Not to believe in him is insane because we need to be bolstered um, in our faith. Uh, the, the book, um, 
of course, his title is, athe is Atheism Dead. And I kind of thought, let me look at atheism a little bit, which I really ha haven't before. Because like everybody else, I just assume like, those really smart atheists, they must, must have some amazing arguments. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you, it was deeply embarrassing to me to read what they say. It is like, I mean, if you've ever met somebody really, really smart, who in some ways is unbelievably stupid, you, you almost can't believe how embarrassing some of their arguments are. I mean, they can take cheap pot shots at the Bible, but I'm saying when you say, okay, life has no meaning to talk to me, but it becomes embarrassing if you look seriously at it. And what I was really amazed to find, in the course of writing this book, I discovered something really shocking, that two of the most, well, actually three of the most famous atheists in the 20th century, Anthony Flew, uh, who wrote textbooks on atheism, and, but Albert Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre. Some of you are familiar with those names from the days you were an undergraduate and you were forced to read their unbelievably depressing essays and books. Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, both of whom were convinced were living in a world without God, at the end of their lives, both of them, 20 years apart, independently, came to believe in God. When I read that, I fell out of my chair. I said, how, how have I never heard this? Like, these are the most famous names of atheism in the 20th century, and th they came to faith, but, like, nobody's written about it? It, it really, it's, it's one of those things, like, we've been gaslit, folks. We've all bought into these narratives, and we just kind of move on and move on. But I'm here to tell you that the two men that looked the hardest at the idea of a world without God came to the conclusion, like, no, it doesn't make sense. So we need to at least know that. But they were intellectually serious atheists. Most of the new atheists, whether Hitchens and Dawkins or whatever, they are fundamentally unserious. And I'm, I'm not kidding when I say, I, mean, I was embarrassed reading what they wrote. They were, it's like they were just whoring after cheap undergraduate applause or something like that. Like they're not serious, it's just, it's really bad. And I thought, we need to understand, like, they don't have a leg to stand on. It's, 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 it's preposterous. I don't have time to go into the arguments, but it's, it's very bad. And so, you know, you come to the conclusion that even if I don't want to believe there's a God, I'm afraid that the evidence makes it impossible not to believe in God if I dare to look at it. But what's most amazing is when you realize that the God who created everything, and again, the more you look at it, the more it's kind of heart-stopping and frightening who God is. How intelligent, how amazing would you have to be to create the universe out of nothing? And it's just, it goes on and on and on. But the, the most extraordinary part to me is that God, in his mercy and his love, desires to have a personal relationship with you. That's where it gets really crazy. He's not just an energy force existing apart from you. He is a person who, to make himself somewhat comprehensible to us, became a human being, sent his son Jesus into this world to show us what he's like and to demonstrate the ultimate act of self-sacrificial love, to die on a Roman cross. It's unbearable when you think about it. And the idea that he wants a relationship with us, because here's the bottom line, folks. We all have problems. We all know that we have problems. If you don't know that you have problems, you're a fool, right? Like your real problem is that you don't know that you have problems. If you're honest at all, you understand we have problems, okay? If you're married, marriage is tough. Sometimes she don't listen. I think most good marriages are tough. Marriage is tough. You have children, how's that going? <laughs> Life is tough. You got a job, some of us have real problems, like huge problems, right? Well, God says, I love you and I wanna help you. I am your answer to these problems. Now, most of us, we get through life and we try to figure out ways and figure, but God says, listen, I'm not kidding. 
I know you, I know your problems, I know your broken dreams, I know your fears, I know your hopes, I love you, I want a personal relationship with you. And you live in a world that says, oh, I don't know about that, that's scary. Let me tell you what's scary, not having that relationship with Jesus, trust me when I tell you, that is scary. That is scary, that's crazy. That's crazy because the evidence for God is overwhelming. And you could talk to innumerable people like myself who I've had so many experiences with God that if somebody says to me like, well, I don't know, Eric, you think you're imagining it? I know I'm not. Maybe I can't communicate it to you, but like I know the God of the Bible is real. He's communicated with me innumerable times in various ways and he communicates to everybody differently. It's not gonna be the same, okay? Because it's like when you're talking to your kids or whatever, everybody's different. But God is the same and he wants to communicate with us. And he, he's not like the clockmaker God, like he exists and he doesn't care. He knows your struggles and he desires to have a relationship with you to help you. And, but he won't force you to open your heart to him. He will not force you. He made you in his image which means he gave you free will, he gave you the, the ability to reject him if you choose. He, he's not gonna force himself on you, but he loves us, he provides ample evidence, whether from science or anecdotal evidence or, or people that you've met that are amazing, and he says, I am the answer to your problems. I'm the answer to all your problems. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm gonna snap my fingers. Sometimes he does, sometimes, when you say, Lord, I can't take it anymore, help me, he does miraculous things. I have experienced that, and I know innumerable people that have experienced that. But sometimes he holds your hands and walks, holds our hands and walks with us through the problems. And if you don't think that's real, let me tell you something, walking through your problems with Jesus is utterly different than walking through your problems without Jesus. He, he, he loves us on a level that Again, it's, it's, it's almost incomprehensible. But it's the reason we're on the planet. Now, some of us know Psalm 23, right? Some of us know it by heart. Some of us, you've heard it all your life. How does it start? I can't remember, it's early. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, and this is the, the King James, he restoreth my soul, he restoreth my soul. Folks, you're not like, you know, meat robots that without a soul like a bug. We are made in his image, we have souls, and God says, I know you have a soul, and I want to restore your soul to wholeness. And I just think, unless you're just hopelessly arrogant or petulant, how do you reject that offer that the God who created the universe and who created you and knows every detail of your life wants to reach out to you. Now, if you've got some really horrible sin that you're hiding, here's some good news. He knows. <laughs> and he wants to give you total forgiveness for what, whatever those sins are. He loves you that much. You say, well, I, I don't know. Well, I'm just here to tell you, in the interest of time, yes, he does. He wants to forgive you totally. He wants to heal those wounds. He wants to restore your soul. And to cut to the chase, it is why we're on the planet, folks. It's why you're breathing air today. He called you into this life so that he could have a personal relationship with you. You were created for that. That's not extra credit. You were literally created to have a relationship with the one who made you, who knows you, who knows your problems. He wants 
to give you purpose in life. Not just that you're trying to get by, but that he says, I have an adventure for you. I have things for you. I don't want you to miss it. If you insist on missing it, you can miss it. But the Lord says, anything I can do to lead you to have a relationship with me so I can show you why you're here. And it doesn't matter how many days you have left on this earth. God can redeem decades and decades in a moment and can make whatever you have left infinitely valuable. That is God. Only God could do that. In the natural, you say, well, that doesn't make sense. I've destroyed my life. You have no idea. First of all, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, he defeated death on the cross. So even if you're to die tomorrow, if you accept him today, he has an infinite eternity of purpose and life for you in a place we call heaven because it's pretty good. It's even better than this ballroom. Can you imagine a place like that? This is, what I'm telling you is true. I know that it's true. If you dare to look into it, it's true. But, but, but God does not want us all to get involved in intellectual shenanigans. If you choose simply to say, Lord, I'm tired. I just, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. Show me how I can walk with you. If this really is the whole reason I exist, show me. I'm here to tell you, folks, it is the only way to live. The adventure of walking with God. This is not talking about becoming some religious fanatic because we've all met them and I don't like them either. <laughs> this is talking about making a connection with the one who loves you, who created you, who died for you and desires to give your life meaning and purpose and wholeness, who desires to restore your soul and to make you a beacon of hope and light in whatever world you live in. That is literally why we exist, and to miss that is the saddest thing imaginable. And so this morning, I don't know where you are, I just want to tell you, you don't want to miss this. This is literally the point of your life, and I'm here to tell you very, very bluntly, I know God is speaking through me to you. I know I'm nobody. God knows I'm nobody. My wife really, really knows <laughs> that I'm nobody. But I also know that God speaks through nobodies because he loves you. And I'm telling you what I'm saying now, it's not me talking. God is speaking to you. He wants to restore your soul. He loves you. He brought you here at this ungodly hour <laughs> because he wants to make the rest of your life something glorious. And I recommend you accept that invitation. God bless you. It's obvious the bite of Almighty God in Eric's soul. So crystal clear. And I know that there are many here today that have not really trusted the God that we know exists. And today, you have a tremendous opportunity. Today is a day that you can leave here changed completely, totally. The God that Eric spoke of desires to have a personal relationship with you through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If somebody would look at that red envelope on the table and pass out the cards for a second. I want you to look at me for one second, please. We do this breakfast for three reasons. One, to give God glory. Two, to return a church to prayer. And three, to present Jesus Christ to those that have not accepted Christ as their Savior. So today, we're going to have that opportunity. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And as you look at that card, we have that card so that you can write your name and make the, uh, the appropriate response on this card that I received Jesus for the first time. I renewed my commitment to Jesus. 
I would like to discuss about the message. I would like to discuss my spiritual needs. I'm interested in connecting with other Christians, learning God's way of doing business, helping with this breakfast, and sponsoring a table and event sponsorship. We do this for you. We do this because we feel called of God, as Eric so clearly described. God is talking to you. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I'm asking everybody not to move around. Just take another couple of minutes with us, and they're going to retire the colors when I'm finished. But let's pray. Let's go before God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bow before you. Almighty God, thank you for today. Thank you for rearranging history to have us here at this precise moment in time. Father, thank you that you love us individually so much that you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross and the blood that he shed on that cross, Father. Thank you that it washes our sins away. As far as the east is from the west, God, you said you'd remember our sins no more as far as the east is from the west. There's no guilt when we come to you. So say this prayer with me in your heart. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to look at me. God, look at my soul. Father, forgive me. Forgive me, God, for sinning against you. Father, please forgive me for not really appreciating you. Father, forgive me for not accepting Jesus as my Savior. Forgive me for my sins, Lord. And Father, I'm asking you right now in the name of Jesus, help me, God, to serve you. Please, God, cleanse me and forgive me. Jesus, come into my life right now. Jesus, come into my life right now. Jesus, I open the door of my heart. Jesus, come into my heart right now, please. I don't know what it means, God, but I know I need you and I want you. And Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me and to cleanse me. Please help me, Jesus. Please come in, Jesus. Father, you've seen and heard the cry of my brother and sister in this room right now. And Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we pray you protect this seed right now with the power of heaven. Almighty God, the Holy Spirit, we yield to you right now. Minister to the people right now. Let them sense God's presence. Let them sense God himself in their soul. Father, we look to you right now and thank you for this morning. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We just want to let everybody know how appreciative we are that Eric came with us today. Eric, we can't thank you enough. Well, let me tell you something. It's an honor and a joy and a privilege, and I want to thank you for letting me be a part of this. I, I just feel very blessed. Thank you. Well, you're welcome, Eric. The, yeah. God, the fire of God, the, your passion for Jesus, the, the clearness of your message today was just right from the Holy Spirit. Praise so, God. God really used you, Eric. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. God bless you. Hi, this is Jim Maxim, and I just want to thank for those of you that came today. We thought God really moved amongst us. We're so grateful that you were part of that. And uh, you may have never thought of helping us financially do this, but we could use some help. So I would ask you to prayerfully consider uh, making a donation to Acts 413 Ministries to help us underwrite programs like this. So thank you, and God bless you. We appreciate you coming so much. Take care.